Omelas is an idyllic and happy city. Its citizens are comfortable and blissful. It is free from war or want. However, in the deepest abyss of one of its buildings, in a small closet-sized room with a locked door and no windows, exists one malnourished and neglected child who has to live its days in desolation. This child routinely cries out, Please, let me out. I will be good. But it is deliberately ignored by the citizens. They all know it is there. Some of them understand why it is there. Most don't. But they all understand that their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, depend wholly on this child's misery. Those are the terms for Omilas' existence. If this child is brought out in the sunlight, or fed, or comforted, all the prosperity and beauty of Omilas would immediately vanish. Many nations across the world have made a similar utilitarian trade-off and suppressed or ignored large sections of their society. They have coerced their societies to follow one culture, one ideology and one leader. India is being gradually homogenized according to those very principles of hierarchy, patriarchy and fundamentalism that our founders from Gandhiji, Pandit Nehru, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Sardar Patel, Maulana Azad decidedly rejected at the birth of this nation. The state no longer tolerates, let alone engages with India's deep diversities. The question that faces us, indeed the whole world today, is how should a nation negotiate with and accommodate social cultural diversity? On this very day, August 8, 1942, Mahatma Gandhi and the Congress Party launched the Quit India Movement with the famous Karenge Ya Marenge slogan. In this context, I want us to reflect on what Tony Morrison once said. There is no time for despair, no time for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. I know the world is bruised and bleeding, and though it is important not to ignore its pain, it is also critical to refuse to succumb to its malevolence. Like failure, chaos contains information that can lead to knowledge even wisdom. In Jammu and Kashmir, that, uh, that horizons the way we think about pluralism, secularism, and the anxieties of coexistence, the possibilities of peaceful coexistence. Irrespective of debating the politics and the legality of it, we know on the ground what is going on. Now to try to pull something more positive out of this dark cloud that looms over a conversation like this, it also alerts us to the fact that when we rethink pluralism, it's not an academic exercise. It's not exclusively an academic exercise. As the current crisis shows us, it is a, um, it's an urgent question that we have to ask ourselves, that we have to try to answer. And in some cases, it's an existential question. Pluralism is an existential reality. Each one of us in every hour of the day, every day of the year, lives with the plural aspect of our existence. Do we all eat the same kind of food? Do we all speak the same language? Do we all dress the same way? Do all, we all behave the same way? Do we all worship or do not worship the same gods? So, it intrigued me a great deal that a bunch of Indians should be compelled to discuss pluralism in their own society. The fact remains that we are today confronted with a situation where the basic value is being contended. It is being challenged that we are not a plural society. We cannot behave in a certain way. Each one of us is free and independent to decide his or her own course within the framework of the country and its uh, 
social and legal norms. We have to stop and try to analyze why it is happening, number one. We have to accept that those values of pluralism, secularism, democracy, which we took for granted all these years, are now being challenged, that they are under siege, and therefore, we need to reinvest in them. My own instance, I was born in the city of Chennai, today it's called city of Chennai, it was Madras. Born to a Telugu, upper caste, uh, Telugu speaking family. When the states divided, reorganized, my family moved to Andhra Pradesh. So I grew up studying in Hyderabad. Hyderabad then was a city full of Islamic culture and tradition, which was then the part of the Nizam's rule. So my talim in that sense was part of that. Then I moved to Delhi for higher education. Got elected to the parliament from Calcutta. And who am I? Married to a half uh, Muslim Islamic Sufi and a Rajputian Pandit who settled for eight centuries in Karnataka. What would my son be called? What is his identity? There's only one identity and that is Indian. And that is our pluralism. And that is what we all, we all belong to. This is something that was born as a battle of three visions that emerged during the decade of 1920s. You had the mainstream vision of the leadership of the freedom movement, which recognized the fact that India, with its plurality, can be kept united only on the basis of granting equality to all its diversities, language, religious, culture, traditions, etc., and therefore, the secular democratic republic can only be the future of this subcontinent called India. As opposed to this was the left vision that I represent today, which said secular democratic, alternate, secular democratic foundations cannot be the end of the story. The political independence that is won by India, when it's won, will have to be converted into the economic independence of its people. Otherwise, the foundations of the secular democracy itself will continue to weaken. That unfortunately happened post-independence, which is what is the result we are seeing, seeing today. As opposed to these two visions, was the third, which had a twin expression. One was the vision, I mean both were talking of the identity of India should be based on the religious affiliation of its people. One spoke of the Islamic State, the other spoke of the Hindu Rashtra or the RSS idea of the Hindu Rashtra. So this battle, unfortunately the time of, the, of independence led to the unfortunate partition and that happened but the battle did not end after independence. The battle continued and that is what we are seeing today unfold, to find an enemy within. We can have innumerable examples of what happened in history, whether it's the Jews or whether it's the Irish or whether it is anybody else, I mean, from any other part of the world or the Palestinians today, to create that enemy within in order to ensure the establishment of a, a monolithic, homogenized society. That is impossible in a country like India. We have seen in our history that people are killed mercilessly, increasingly so, for no other reason except the fact that they belong to a community that has been constructed in the popular mind as either the enemy or as, in inverted commas, inferior. Multiple languages, multiple cultures are just a better way of being. My colleague, Professor Oberoi from the Sociology Department in Delhi University say, used to say that you look at a Bombay Hindi film, the young men and women talk in Hindi but increasingly English, but when they sing, they sing in Urdu. Particularly when the script has been authored by Javed Akhtar or by Gulzar, suddenly they start to uh, write, as, you know, and that makes it so much more exciting. That is what music is. To belong to a plural society is to launch on a 
new adventure every day. Monochromatic societies are boring. Point in living in a society where everybody believes in the same thing. I think you subscribe to a very diminished view of the human being because we are unfortunately ruled by a party that hasn't grown since 1923 when Savarkar wrote what, what it is to be a Hindu. They have no new idea. They are caught in the colonial stereotypes of Hindu and Muslim. And this is a colonial stereotype. They have not been able to progress all the big debates of Indian politics or global politi political philosophy have bypassed them. Multiculturalism, minority rights, citizenship, cosmopolitanism, notion of obligation. It's a very truncated mindset. And unfortunately, I'm an old-fashioned political scientist. I feel that social discourses are always molded by the dominant political discourse. That is why the state is important. And now we are again seeing partitions of minds and hearts. और वहाँ उनको बड़े-बड़े सिद्ध पुरुष मिले, जो भक्ति कर रहे थे, साधना कर रहे थे, और उनसे उनका शास्त्रार्थ हुआ, बातचीत हुई, तो उन्हें कहा, आपको बातें तो बहुत अच्छी-अच्छी आती हैं, पर आप यहाँ मानसरोवर में क्यों बैठे हैं? आप जाइए जनता में जाके काम कीजिए, तो उन्होंने कहा नहीं, जनता म लोगों में अपना ज्ञान बांटना है, लोगों को वो वैल्यूज सिखानी है, जिसकी हम बात करें, और वो किरतपुर साहब वापस आए और 16 साल उन्होंने खेती की, और वहाँ से अपनी बात को फैलाना शुरू किया लोगों में रहके, जो वैल्यूज की हम बात कर रहे हैं, आज सेक्युलरिज्म शब्द को कोई मत इस्तेमाल करें, लिबरल और जल्दी से जल्द वापस आ पाएं यही कोशिश हम लोग कर रहे हैं थैंक यू